Hello and welcome to my week 2 status update for Blood Sun. This week I have worked mostly on the rules. Following my design goals, I first went into general rules and basically copied and rephrased what I needed from 5e to get the base of the game going. So I've got ability. I've got skills, but a uh, slightly different and shorter list than the 5e list. And instead of weapon and armor proficiencies, I've got weapon skills. Uh, anyone can wear armor if they want to, anyone can use any weapon, but if you got the proper skill, you get your skill bonus to your ability checks. A short description of ability checks, advantage, disadvantage, help. Also worked on character creation. First I started with these class ideas and I just mindstormed and put anything in here that came to my mind. And then at some point I started putting things in order and putting them into classes and three subclasses per class. And these are the classes I eventually elaborated on. So I've got my elementalist, which is a kind of elemental mage. And uh, I took inspiration from Five Torches Deep about how elaborate my class should be. So I'm just going to level 5. I got my skill bonus. I got what spell power they have. And I'm not using the standard D&D system where I've got a limited number of spells each day. Instead I have a corruption system where casting spells gives you corruption. And in the case of an elementalist, you turn more and more into your chosen element until you lose yourself in your element. Then I started uh, doing spell lists for my classes, but eventually I had to conclude that I don't have enough elemental spells to fill all my elementalist uh, schools of magic. So I went with uh, a free magic system. Basically the player describes what he wants to do with the magic and then using this table as help the GM says uh, what the player has to roll and how much corruption it will give him. So uh, in this table there's the effect the range the spell would have and what area of effect it would have. And the player picks two of these so you can have a lot of range and a lot of effect. You can have a lot of effect and a lot of area of effect or a little bit of everything. And from uh, Five Torches Deep I've got my uh, archetype system which gives you a bigger skill list. So each class has a skill lists, not skills the class just gives you, but skills you can choose. So the elementalist chooses two skills from this list uh, and character creation. And then uh, every other level he gets another skill, but he gets magic, so he doesn't get a lot of skills. And at level 3 you choose an archetype, and at level 3, 6 and 9 you get an ability from your archetype. So you can choose half of those presented here. Uh, 
I've got my mercenary, which is basically my fighter class. They uh, start with four skills and have a huge skill list, but it's all combat skills, or nearly all. Um, so they get more skills at the start and they get more skills as a whole. At second level they get the action surge, at fifth level they get an extra attack and at tenth level another extra attack. So these are really good fighters. And I've got my three archetypes, gladiator, bodyguard and gunslinger. Got the Nomad, which is my Ranger list, but I don't have something like uh, magic using noble rangers. These are just people that are comfortable living in the wilderness. So they get a lot of skills and also one extra attack. And I've got my uh, three archer types, the Beastmaster, the Guru, who uh, is a kind of uh, drug dealing hermit, and the Hunter. I've got my Outlaw class, which is basically the Rogue. So they get cunning action, one extra attack. Um, they get the ability to evade uh, damage at 5th level, and they've got lots and lots of skills. I've got my archetypes of Thief, Smuggler, and Killer. I have, uh, have my Scoundrel, which is kind of a social character, a trickster. Um, so they take a bit of from the Bard class, but they've got no magic, so they've once again got lots of skills. And they can also inspire their ally to get plus 1d4 to an ability check, later 1d6 and 1d8. I've got my archetypes, the Entertainer, the Cartesian, and the Merchant. Finally, I've got my Warlock. It's my second spell uh, casting class, so they don't get a lot of skills, but they uh, can cast magic. And each warlord chooses a pact, and depending on the pact, they can cast different kinds of magic. So I've got a great old one here, Ictuli. P, unspeakable horror. The dragon, which is at this moment the only dragon left on Thandor. A creature of uh, complete law and order. And we've got the Red Queen, the ruler of the Fae Court. So uh, they get a bit of illusion and wild magic. And I also get my archetypes, the Blood Mage. Uh, who's get a lot of hit points and can replenish his hit points if he wounds an enemy in close combat. We've got the summoner, who's really good at summoning help. And the witch, who's more into uh, control and transmutation and can channel her corruption to others. I've still got my spell lists in here, but I won't copy them into the final document it was a lot of time making these spell lists but then I asked my players what they actually want and they want this free magic system so I'll be focusing focusing on that trying to balance this uh, and give more like uh, of help how to use it and not copy all these long spell lists I uh, did most of my combat rules. Uh, if you've played in 3 d it's not, nothing uh, changed dramatically. Uh, so like in 5e you get your main actions and you've got movement actions and free actions. 
I've got cover, I've got two weapon fighting, but I'm using a really simple rule where if you have a weapon in your offhand, you just get 1d4 to your attack roll. That's it. Doesn't matter if you have two super huge weapons. Um, in my experience, doing some sword fighting, it's not that big of an advantage. It's not like you can attack twice as fast. Your body doesn't work like that. I've got area attacks because I'll be using like automatic weapons and grenades and fireballs. So having a fast rule for this is not bad. Automatic fire rules. And uh, damage and healing. I'm using hit points less, just as luck and endurance. So as long as you have hit points, you're fine. Nothing serious happens, but once you go under zero hit points, you uh, can roll on this table for critical wounds. And if you are taking a lot of damage and you're really unlucky, you can get stuff like left hand destroyed, slash guts, and head chopped clean off. So this can get pretty deadly. Um, armor is working differently because I didn't want to make armor super mandatory. It's no longer a bonus to your armor class. You get your bonus from your dex modifier and you can get the defense skill and the shield to get your armor up, your AC up. And I'm calling it also defense because it has nothing to do with armor anymore. And instead, armor absorbs damage, two, four and eight points, depending if you have light, medium or heavy armor. And quick rules for healing. Healing hit points is pretty quick, but healing these critical hits, these right leg cut to pieces, uh, takes a lot longer, as you could imagine. I've got my special damage types. I didn't want to go with as many damage types as 5e has, so I've basically got regular damage, fire, cold, poison, that's it for now. Um, I've got equipment rules. I uh, need, of course, my uh, own kind of weapons and armor for my world. Um, made some short rules for the weight of the equipment. If you're running a survival type of campaign, it becomes important how much you can carry. So I lifted this from the Forbidden Lands role-playing game and each item is either light, normal or heavy and takes up slots in your inventory and you have like uh, your strength score slots you can carry and if you carry any more it slows you down and you get uh, fatigued really fast. Short description of money, I'm uh, just calling it coins. A coin is about a silver and I don't worry about any other type of money. In most places of the world, they uh, use bartering anyhow. I've got my weapons. You can categorize them as light, medium, and heavy weapons. And uh, one trick, you could call it, I lifted from Dark Souls is if you are strong enough, you can use any weapon in one hand. Um, so medium weapons 11, heavy weapons 15, and then I've got a list uh, with more detailed weapons. So I've got uh, like a knife, anyone can use a knife, it can be thrown, it's light, just costs 10 coins. And at the end of this, we've got a zweihander and a great axe. And you need 17 strength to wield a zweihander in one hand. And it's a heavy item taking two slots and it's 250 coins. Um, ranged weapons I've got in two categories, light and heavy. Most of them are light and my heavy weapons are like uh, machine guns you have to set up. So they've got a minimum of strength as well and that is the strength to wield the weapon without support. So if you're on a Schwarzenegger or Rambo you can pick up your machine gun with strength 17 and just carry it around shooting at stuff. If you have not strength 17, you have to set it up for like a minute on a tripod and then anyone can use it. 
I've got uh, a wide technological um, variety in these weapons here. On the one hand, I've got uh, like crossbows, chokunus, and ballistas. And on the other hand, I've got my machine gun and anti tank rifle. So I came up with some quick rules for the form of loading, what kind of technology the weapon represents. And if you got something like a magazine fed semi automatic weapon, these might jam on when uh, one or two is rolled on an attack and you have to clear the jam. But you don't have to reload these very often. You can shoot more, you can use automatic fire. Got some rules for material, uh, very similar to Darkson. So if you are uh, somewhere in the Badlands and have no material to work with and make your weapons out of bone, if you roll maximum damage, uh, there's a break chance. Like for bone, it's one on uh, World on D2, so 50%, but they would be a lot cheaper. And this goes all the way up to proper steel, which only has one in ten chance. And artifact weapons that are left over from the War of the Gods. And those don't break at all, but would be hugely expensive. Short description of my armor. And to uh, balance these armor somewhat, you get a maximum... Dex bonus, just in 5e, it's 2 for medium armor, and for heavy armor, it's none. And you will also get more damage if you are doing strenuous activity like marching or running a lot. Short list of adventuring gear, and this I still have to work on. Uh, I did some monster rules. For converting the monsters from 5e or similar. Uh, Bloodstone characters will have a lot less hit points. I currently think I just give them their constitution score, so they have between 3 and 18 hit points, and that means a regular 5e monster has way too many hit points. But I came up with a short rule if you just take uh, one of the hit dice of the monster take the maximum and then add the number of hit dice. You get a more reasonable number, like for this Tyrannosaurus, Se this Tyrannosaurus Rex. It has 13 d12 hit points. So I just take 1 d12, 12 plus 13, making 25 hit points. Um, then you have to adjust the armor because it works differently. So... Uh, you take a look what armor the creature would have with just the dex bonus and maybe plus two if it has a shield and if it is skilled in defense. And you compare this to the listed AC and the difference should be the creature's armor. Example, the T-Rex has AC 13 but no dex mod and no shield and no skill so it has an armor of 3. And I'm keeping the damage of the T-Rex. This means it will one-shot most characters super deadly. But if you find yourself in the mouth of a T-Rex, uh, you will have a very bad day. So you have to use careful planning, maybe traps, ambush and poison or vehicles to kill these big monsters and can't just... Uh, Try your best in single combat against the T-Rex. Monsters should be scary as fuck. And I've got some uh, fast and hard rules for my vehicles. Um, so they are as similar as possible to characters in my normal combat rules. So they have a strength that tells me how much they can carry. They have a speed, just like a character's, hit points, just like a character's, armor, exactly the same, and a maximum dex bonus, 
that is the dex bonus that the pilot can add to his maneuvers and to the defense of the vehicle. So if you have a very nimble car, a very nimble vehicle like this motorcycle, maximum dex bonus 5. And if you got a 15 ton truck, maximum dex bonus minus 2. Uh, also how many seats you have and how fuel efficient they are. If you're running a survival type of campaign, fuel might become a major concern. Got all types of cars, planes, small and big airships, boats, small merchant ship. Um, travel speed depends a lot about the environment and the weather. So rather than having any hard rules for this, the GM just has to make up what makes sense. My rules for vehicle combat is you're using a kind of moving battlefield. If you have like a chase rather than moving all of your cars each round for like 10 centimeters across your battlefield, you just pretend that the battlefield moves under the cars each round and uh, so it becomes a static scene and the cars move around in the static scene like characters with their speed and their speed is not actually how fast they're going because that is mostly irrelevant but how fast they can change direction and speed how fast they can catch up to other cars how fast they can brake and i've uh, got some extra actions like ramming or stunt or keeping steady that a pilot can do when he is piloting a vehicle. And finally I came up with my magic rules. I started going for a spell system. So I've got modifications of existing spells. We have a lot less hit points, so I can't have spells that make super high damage. So I've lowered this. I've got my corruption ru rules. Every time you cast a spell, you lose part of your humanity. So uh, depending on how powerful your spell is, it's just 1 or d d12. You have a threshold of 5 plus your level. Every time you exceed that, you gain a rank of corruption. So that starts with like fiery eyes. And then it becomes. Uh, you turn into an uh, extraterrestrial squid, or a human shaped elemental. And at level 4, you become fully corrupted and turn into your element, or your master claims your body and soul. And corruption gain not from spell casting. This is a bit like madness system or the stress system from Darkest Dungeons or Call of Cthulhu. So if your characters witness unspeakable acts of cruelty and strangeness, they get corruption as well. So they become uh, more and more emotionally cold and distant and go crazy. And then if they uh, get three ranks of this corruption, they become super psychopath or uh, just completely uh, dead crazy bastards. So they become an NPC. And you've got ways of lessening this corruption. Uh, you must spend some time reconnecting with your human side. So a nice campfire chat in the evening before a long rest will uh, give you one point back. Day of meditation, prayer or spending time with your family will reduce it by 1d6. And a night out in the tavern or brothel will reduce it by 1d8. This is mostly taken from Darkest Dungeons. And this makes it so the characters take their downtime and 
don't just go from uh, one crazy adventure into the next. Um, also, I was working on spell system. I came up with some really simple elemental spells because I didn't have enough spells for the elementalist. But then I settled on the free magic system. And rules wise, it's really simple. The player has some restrictions what kind of magic he can use. If he's got an elementalist, he can only use the magic of his element, control his element. If he's a warlock, he can only use magic coming from his master's domain, like illusions or nightmares or control time and space. And he describes what he wants to do to his GM, and the GM comes up with uh, an ability check, how difficult it is to cast, and how much corruption the spell will generate. There's still a lot to do in the rules alone. For character creation, I still need all of my races. Uh, for the equipment, I still need rules for like potions, drugs, and alchemy. But I'm nearing the point where I would say the rules are feature complete and I can start writing it all together. And then I can focus back on the world building and uh, describe one area of the map where the campaign will be a bit more in detail. And that will probably be here or maybe here. I've asked my players and they want to play like um, grave robbers and scavengers, basically adventurers, um, exploring the ruins of the world before the War of the Gods that are strewn about in uh, the Badlands and the desert of the hot side of Thunder. So I will be focusing on an area that is maybe 100 kilometers wide or something that will give them a few weeks of travel in any direction and then put a few important places, a few towns, a few bigger landmarks in there and uh, we can start adventuring in there. They can expand the map as I introduce more of the world to my characters. Yeah, that's it for today. Thanks, and goodbye.